Uh, so I'm Adam. I'm the Japanese and Korean studies librarian here for the University of Colorado. Um, and I do this series of workshops. If you want to, there's a copy of the schedule for the semester you can take. There's my uh, name cards, my meishi, and there's also these rack cards, which is kind of like Japanese resources at CU. Those papers are scrap. So uh, I do not have a handout for this one, but if you would like to actually write things down, which would be helpful, um, by all means, please do. I don't have a concurrent website to go with this just yet. That's coming in the future. So, um, but that is coming. So uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, I've designed this around what I think you need and what I think is advantageous for you as students or learners. But at any time, you know, the thing that will be matter the most is what is interesting to you. So this is the kind of workshop where you can just stop and ask questions. And you also are not required to stay here until six. You can leave anytime you want. If you need to use the restroom, if you need to take a phone call, you can just go out. I promise I will not be offended and hold it against you for the rest of your lives. Uh, this is really meant to be a casual kind of setup and you are uh, welcome here. The other thing is that if, if you do go early, I asked, um, you can do this on your phone as well. If you can go here and fill out this little miniature survey, it's like, five questions for you to fill out. And it just kind of gives me feedback on what to do and change and improve with these workshops. So I hope that, uh, and this is really important for me. So you don't have to do it because you've done it already. But, um, but do do this before it's over. And I'll remind you all again at the end if you can do it. So I'm just going to kind of jump in to everything. And as we go through this, the thing to think about is I did throw up these little notes and questions on the side about Japanese pictures and how to use them, when to use them, what is it you want to do, what is the goal you want to accomplish. Um, obviously, you want to get grades in your classes or have more, use it to have more conversational Japanese. Um, there's different contexts for these. And also really important is not getting overwhelmed. So uh, when you use these dictionaries, you want to establish a sort of workflow that works for you. And each of you is going to have something different that you want. And I can't quite tell you what that should be for you, but I can give you some rough ideas. So kind of how all of this stuff comes together and how to use it in a practical way. So you're in the 4,000 advanced reading course. Mm -hmm. So you're going to use these in a very different way than say someone who wants to, who's going to Japan in the spring for study abroad, right? Different needs, different goals. So that's something to keep in mind is each of you has your own set of needs and goals, but I think everyone can use this, this conundrum of dictionaries to sort of figure things out. So the other thing is this is sponsored by the Jet Alumni Association of the Rocky Mountains. So I'm actually the president of the Jet Alumni Association, but I had to have my board vote with me abstaining in order for them to fund the food and stuff for this. So thank you to them and myself, but, um, but they are helping fund this. And so to jump into it, I'm going to start with this kind of idea, right? So if you're going to play a game, uh, games, what makes a game a game is that there are rules to the game, right? So you need to follow those rules. Now, if you're, um, if you are anybody, does anybody here enjoy game boards? Board games, rather. Video games, that kind of thing. OK, so if you want to go to Japan and, and show your Japanese friends how to play Catan, you have to talk about it to them and explain it to them. And I'm going to start with an example about this idea of follow the rules. So um, where would you go to look up the verb to follow in English to know how to say it in Japanese? In your real world? Online. Online. But do you, know, do you have a particular website you prefer? So most students use jisho.org, which is conveniently just Japanese for a dictionary. So if you look up follow in jisho.org, you know, the first thing you're going to get is this verb right here, which is tadoru. The second one is this katakana foro. And the third one's going to be narao. The next one's going to be shitagao. And on and on and on. And the thing is, is that all of these verbs that mean to follow are wrong. Um, these are not the, if you say ruru, ruru being rule, ruru o tadoru, that will come across as very strange because it sounds like you're walking down a road following someone else down that road as opposed to playing a game. So even though it means follow, it doesn't mean the follow that you want. Um, and so this comes, uh, this comes with this idea of uh, what's called a collocation dictionary. So this is common Japanese collocations, and that's this guy right here. Um, so, and I'm going to pass it around in just a moment, but you'll, the, this is, um, and the reason I bring up this print so resource is that there really isn't an online resource that exists that deals with this particular scenario, but how to use 
Japanese correctly. So a collocation is this idea of, um, uh, you would say something like, um, uh, uh, so if you're talking about a river, for example, right? And you're going to say that the river is fast flowing, but you could arguably say, oh, the river is fast running, which sounds a little awkward. It's not correct English, but the idea is there. But those words don't go together well. And as native speakers of English, we just take for granted we know how to say it. So if I say torrential, the next word is rain. torrential rain, torrential downpour right? Those words, they go together. They naturally fit together. Um, and so uh, the way that, and I'll, I'll talk about how this particular dictionary is set up because it's set up in a very counterintuitive way, but the correct term for a game becomes popular, games make a game popular. Oh, here it is. Observe the rules of a game. So the, it's hard to see here, but the verb is game, game no ruru o mamoru. Does anyone know the verb mamoru? You should know it. What does mamoru mean? To protect. to protect. So you're literally saying that you're protecting the rules in Japanese. They don't say follow. So this is this idea where you can't have this one-to-one -one equivalency in English and Japanese. And this is kind of where students often get tripped up. They think, oh, I'll just look up the verb for follow, find out what it is in Japanese, and say that. But it turns out that the verb you needed in English was protect in order to use the right word. And so this is set up to connect you with all the right um, all the right uh, uh, verbs and nouns that go together. And so what's interesting about the way this dictionary is set up is that it's set up in a way where it's meant to deal with situations. So the ideal circumstance for using this would be when? When there's a situation you're gonna go do? When you, especially if you're living in Japan, you want to go out and do something. Yeah. You want to look up the situation involved and actually learn how to talk about it. Also, in terms of your classes, if you're doing like skits, things like that, and you want to have a situation where like, oh, let's do this skit where we're playing a game. Well, you might want to have a look at this to see how Japanese people actually talk about games and hobbies. So like to be hooked on a game as in I'm like, I'm so addicted right now. Anybody play like Call of Duty or Minecraft or... Uh, I don't know what's the latest Japanese RPG out right now. Final Fantasy XV, are people still playing that or are we already done with it? Um, but that was, that's Hamaru, right? And so that's a different, um, and if we reverse translated that, it probably wouldn't quite mean like to be addicted to something. It would have its own meaning uh, that's a little different from English. But um, to be on the prowl at a club, in case you need to talk about creepy people at clubs, um, but, the, but the, this dictionary tries to acknowledge real life situations and how to actually talk about them. And so it's sort of a reverse engineered dictionary. So you don't look it up by word, you look it up by context, by the situation you're in. Um, and this tells you how to actually speak Japanese in a natural, fluid way. Um, so another example of this that is often a big mistake is, is when um, people talk about that something breaking. So, computer ga hatarakanai or computer ga ukokanai. So, first of all, what does the first verb, hataraku, what does that mean? To work. Right, and we say, oh, the computer's not working. So, ukokanai, meaning, what does ugoku mean? Yeah. To move. And in Japanese, they say the second one for machines that aren't functioning correctly. They say, computer ga ukokanai, oh, the, the computer's not moving. The car is not moving. That's how they talk about broken machinery. So, so you, this is the situation where you have to realize that you can't do this one-to-one -one translation. And that's what the collocation dictionary is for. So you could say, so if I said, for example, in English, like, oh, my computer stopped. It's not wrong, but it's not natural. We would probably say, oh, my computer stopped working or my computer shut down, something like that. That's the more natural English way to say it. But you could still say like, oh, my computer, my computer stopped moving. Sounds a little strange. You could probably guess what people mean if they said that, but that's not how we actually express that idea. Um, and so, for example, so to think about this a little more, right, here's a train uh, in, inside of a train carriage in Japan. Um, what is, um, so, so obviously here's a chair. What are the things you can do with a chair? You can move a chair, you can, you can stand up. So if you say seki o tatsu, that means the chair itself is standing. 
not that you're sti uh, or, or sekio tatsu means that you're the chair is sitting, not that you're standing up from the chair. Um, what about this chair versus this chair? This chair is. No, 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 no. Right? There's nobody in this chair, so this chair is empty. empty. It's, well, it's the more natural English way to say it. Do you have an empty chair? Do, do you have any free chair? Is this free? Is this taken? Right? You can also, at a restaurant, what can you do to a chair? You can reserve it. Right? How do you say to reserve a chair? You're going to say yakusoku, which is not correct. Um, so how do you say all those things in Japanese? Right? Those are actually really basic concepts, but do you know all the verbs that you're going to use to talk about those situations? Right? What about if, um, if, I'm, uh, if I'm an elderly person on the train and I'm standing over you, what are you going to do for me? I hope. Get up and let you sit right? there. Right, so, so, what, like, so you give up yes. the seat, right? Yeah. So, you know, which literally give up means like to quit. Yeah. So if you said like literally to quit a seat in Japanese, that would make no, it, sound like the, it would sound like the chair gave up its job and was going out to find itself, yeah. go on a personal journey of self-discovery, right? That's not what you want to convey when you do that. So these are all the things. To save a seat, right? Is the seat open to switch seats, to stand up or leave, give, take? So again, if you were thinking about the fact like I'm moving to Japan and I'm gonna be riding trains all the time, how do I even like interact with people on a train? Well, what do people do on trains? They sit, they sit, they stand. It sounds silly, but do you actually know how to talk about all of this stuff? And so if you actually look it up, um, there's all these different verbs that deal with it. So to give up a seat is yuzuru or yuzurimas. Um, to make a reservation is toru, like the same toru as to take, but it also means to re reserve a seat in Japanese. Um, <clears throat> and then to save a seat is totte oku, which is a grammatical function that you learn a little bit later when you're studying Japanese. <clears throat> um, giving up a seat, sit in a seat. So it's seki or zaseki ni suru, ni suaru. If you say zaseki o suaru, that sounds like the chair is sitting in another chair. Like the chair is sentient and it's going to take a seat in another chair. So that's why it's zaseki ni suaru. So um, I'll be passing these dictionaries around and it actually is saved on sort of the example that I had given for people to take a look at. Just so that people can kind of see how the dictionary works. And so the dictionary is set up in a very unusual way. It's done by these big categories like daily life or going out or uh, going to work or I need a doctor, like all that kind of stuff. Um, there's a really good example of this is in English, you know, we say, um, what's the verb for like using a saxophone? What's the verb for to use a piano? What's a verb for using a drum? You play the drums. In Japanese, it's, they're all different verbs. They don't use the same verbs. In, you say you pull a, uh, for strings instruments, you say you use the verb to pull. For drums, you do actually use the verb to beat. And then for um, wind instruments, you use the verb for to blow. But they don't have a verb for like to play an instrument. There's not a single verb for that. So there are all these situations that arise. So if you are interested in music, you should look for the music section of that book to see how Japanese talk about music and how they talk about instruments, right? It's, it's really a, a connected to the hobbies you have and enjoy. Um, so uh, the next step is, right, we had talked a little bit about what do you typically do? You go online and look up a verb, or sorry, a, a, Jap a word. So there's, there's three big ones, and there's definitely more than this. There's uh, jisho.org, tangorin, and uh, japandict.com. And there has, so have you guys used any of these? Who's used jisho? Right, has anybody used tangorin before? Literally forest of vocabulary. Um, or Japan Dict, has anybody heard of these? Jisho is usually the big one, but I do want to show you something about these three that's worth considering. So I'm going to use a really simple example here, right? But if I look up boat, so first of all, it's a little weird that this is the first example, boto, but we want this, we really want this one, fune. So pay careful attention to this uh, definition, ship, boat, watercraft, vessel, steamship. Um, If I load up tangerin and do the same thing, right? Ship, boat, watercraft, vessel, steamship. And if I load up um, Japandict.com, 
Um, I do boat. You're going to see that same ship, boat, watercraft, vessel, steamship definition, which is a little unusual that they're all exactly the same. And so the reason for this, and this is something that really goes under the radar for a lot of students, but they all come from one dictionary file. There is, so Jim Breen is a legend in the Japanese studies community. If you don't know who he is, you should. Um, but this is the WWJDIC is this master dictionary file. It's open source, it's free. And so anytime you go online to look up Japanese, it's all coming from this one dictionary file. And in fact, if you've ever wanted to see what the internet looked like in the late 90s, here you go. They have not changed it at all. And you'll see that when you load it, it is not nearly as user friendly as those other websites. And so what it is, is th this is the file. This is all very um, convoluted and hard to work with. And so these other websites have kind of taken the background information here and put it together for you in a way that's much more user friendly. And so when you're using these three websites, it's really a matter of preference for um, interface. Do you, which one do you like the most? But you're not getting any different information. It's all the same information. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind is anytime a dictionary is free, it's always powered by this file. Um, who has, does anybody have Apple iPhones? Do you have Emiwa, the dictionary app Emiwa? Same file, powered by the exact same file. Um, if you look, go, go to the about, it'll say Jim Breen's dictionary. So, um, so this is something to be aware of. You're not actually getting anything different. It's just, it's also maintained by Monash University in Australia. So there are academics who are handling it. Uh, but just so you know, there's, this is kind of the actual situation happening with um, online dictionaries. It's all just one source. And it's very simple. It's very to the point. And so uh, to use that boat example and to go back to it. So here are three different kanji, and they all mean boat, ship, boat. This is the actual definition in the Jim Breen Dictionary. So all three of these websites will show you this. Ship, boat, boat, ship. Rowboat, small boat. That is not very useful because the first thing you're all wondering is probably what? How? Yeah, how are these different? Why are there these three characters? This doesn't add up. I don't understand. So um, these two in particular are especially confusing. Now, if you're Japanese, and I think it's actually pretty similar in Chinese as well, it's pretty obvious what the differences are. You just know because of exposure. But um, to give you an example, right, we can load it up and we'll go ahead and we'll load this one up. And you'll see boat, ship, ship, boat. It's not particularly useful. So the way you can get around this and kind of get a handle, and this works best with nouns, with objects, with things in the real world. It does, you can't Google image emotions, but you can Google image stuff. And so Google image is sort of this hidden dictionary available to you when you're really struggling to understand the difference between something. And the other thing I would add is that if you do it in Japanese, you never even have to use English. And so you are learning Japanese in Japanese, never relying on English as a way to do it. So um, for example, so first of all, the one thing you need to do is go to google.jp, because if you go to google.com, you'll almost exclusively get Chinese results. And there is, you can't assume that the characters mean the same things in Chinese and Japanese. So if we put in, um, Fune, you know, we're going to get, uh, and then we switch it to images. So we're going to get images like this. So this is a really like, you know, you have like old time looking ships like this, but you have a pretty distinct idea of what boat means when you look at this. It refers to fairly large vessels. If you do um, this Fune and you load it, it becomes really obvious how they're different from each other, right? So if you use, depending on which kanji you use, you're gonna create a different image in people's minds. So this fune is more like a traditional, and for lack of a better description, this is like a traditional stereotypical Asian boat, right? Not a Western make model. And so that's really the distinction between these two characters. And I can guarantee that you'll probably run into exceptions where somebody uses the kanji, like a native speaker will use the kanji in a way that doesn't conform with this, but languages are just naturally messy affairs. Um, any questions so far about anything? All right, we can keep going. So, uh, 
And then the last one, which is actually pronounced te, if you load this one up, you get yet another slightly different kind of boat. And it's actually fairly different. And you'll notice here that you get, you might, you get planes, but they're actually seaplanes. And so if you know your Japanese, if you know your kanji, where's my, let's see, is this one it? So, let's see. So if I'm going to write in Japanese, um, it's a little strange angle for me to be writing at. So you know that this is, um, that's uh, airplane. But if you swap this out for a kanji that I've already forgotten how to write, there it is. <laughs> If you swap it out, hikoki for hikote, it means seaplane. <clears throat> so Google Images is a great way to deal with like objects. Um, all right, so jumping back in, yeah, whoops. Okay, so another one is uh, Japanese particles. So this is a really big challenge for, um, for people who are learning Japanese. But these particles, uh, there's, so for, let's see, our first and second years, you know, of course, you know, wa, ga, o, ni, de. As it turns out, there's actually uh, quite a lot more. There's this many uh, particles in the Japanese language that they, that they use in day. And they mix together in different ways. And you'll see that, like, the particle wa, which is the topic marker, there's five pages of definitions. The particle ni, that usually indicates time and place, there's 18 pages defining all the different ways it can be used. And that goes back to this point over here about getting overwhelmed. Um, it not, is not necessarily a useful exercise to read all 18 definitions of ni, and then it think you're gonna hold all that information in your head and use it. What you really wanna do is, if you run into an unusual use of a particle you already know, it may in fact involve um, uh, one of these particular definitions. So what you're really doing, you're trying to scan for the definition that matches best because you need a sort of contextual experience for these definitions to be meaningful to you. And in fact, if you look this up, here's one page of all the different um, particles that you need to learn in Japanese to be a fluent speaker. So there's much more than just these one syllable particles, actually quite a lot of them, like um, mono, mono nara or mon nara, if you're more casual speaking. Um, and this is, this is what I mean by getting overwhelmed. Like you might want to just start reading about these randomly, but if you're not addressing a need, if you're not addressing a particle that you don't understand, it, it's not very useful to just re read random particles. You want to use it when you are in a situation where you can't make sense of a particle in use. So like the particle de can be really confusing when you first start seeing it, but it's actually a variation on da or des. Um, and it's never really explained ever in your Japanese grammar classes. It's just there. Um, but this will address some of that. Um, and so you also have things like uh, combination particles. That's what the CP means, so te and wa together. Um, and how that works versus just wa on its own. So, uh, so yeah, ni and wa are conveniently highlighted for you in this one to have a gander at. Um, but it's a really great dictionary. We have one in the reference collection for you to use. Um, and so uh, the next one is a grammar dictionary. And so the last couple of dictionaries, what's been really nice about them is that they're very manageable. They're very easy to read. They don't get very sophisticated or complicated in their explanations. But I mean, certainly this ship boat, it's so simple, it's not even possible to quite know what's different about them. But when you get to, and they do, this one does a pretty good job of making the explanations fairly manageable. However, this is a big step up. And so this is a dictionary that um, I think is, you should really learn to use it. But I guarantee that the first time you use it, you will absolutely get overwhelmed and it will be very complicated and confusing. Um, there are equivalent dictionaries in uh, English. If you ever want to check it out, there's a dictionary called the Oxford Practical English Usage Dictionary. Um, it's actually really helpful for people learning foreign languages because it 
tells you how English grammar works, and it's quite surprising how complicated English grammar is. Not that surprising, really, because it is complicated. But um, but this is kind of like this. Uh, but this is kind of like the very technical linguistics explanation of um, how. Uh, Japanese grammar functions, and it is designed to be read by English speakers. So the first one has a 60 pages of introductions explaining the characteristics of Japanese. So there's a, basically a miniature book built into the first dictionary that explains the characteristics of Japanese grammar. There's like 20 pages that explain just how to use the dictionary. Um, it's you, know, you actually have to read the how to use section of this dictionary to use it properly. So there's a time investment you have to make on it. So it demands a lot of you. There is nothing online that is as good as this. There just really isn't. There's JGram, and you can kind of use Gshow to look up different grammatical functions, but nothing will explain it as clearly as this. It's just that it's very technical and it's, it functions at a very high level. So vinf non-past, verb infinitive non-past. S T S O S W. You have to know that those stand for something, someone, somewhere, right? There's a lot of abbreviations and shortcuts built into it. Um, inflectional ending. Does anyone know what the inflectional ending is? Um, uh, we'll answer that maybe a question or changing the. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it should be stuff like tabe reru, tabe rareru, tabe sasereru, tabe sasereru, tabe. Um, even stuff like tabe hodai, like the fact that it um, inflects, it changes to suit the need. So you're thinking inflection like the question, the right raising inflection in English. Yeah, Japanese doesn't have that, so. Do they go through like different dialects with that? Well? No, they do. Yeah, it's just standard it's Japanese. Just so, yeah, okay. But there is. Then, I mean, they use completely different What's the word for? Um, do you know the word for dialect in Japanese? Uh, namari or ben. Uh, almost. Yeah, so hogen. Hogen is the word for dialect in Japanese. A uh, ben is the. That's also like. It could be a really thick tohoku ben. Yeah. Um, okay. So a hogen. Does anyone know the word for dictionary in Japanese? Jisho. Mm, jisho jiten is better. So a hogen jiten is a. Yeah, it's a dictionary for a dialect. So they make dictionaries that just deal with dialects. So like I lived in Kobe, for example, so I spoke with a Kobe accent. Um, and it was made my uh, fourth year Japanese instructor really annoyed because I would speak with this inflection. Uh, but for example, the uh, statement in Japanese, doko kara kimashita ka, where do you come from, where are you from, in Kobe Ben is contracted down to dokito. So... Is that the same if you go in Osaka and stuff? No, it's a Kobe, specifically say, Kobe. Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, so when you said you're not really going to find anything like these online, do you mean these specific ones? Or there's nothing. Uh, uh, this is, there's no good online Japanese grammar dictionary, unless you're a native Japanese speaker already. You know, so, but as an, as an English speaker learning Japanese, this is the definitive um, resource that That's you should specific. own. This is the best, okay. yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know him, but I know his wife because she's a librarian. So, uh, but I highly recommend it. In fact, the, the indexes will, they cite each book by, I think it's um, I, B, and A. And then it has the page number after that letter to tell you which volume to check in. So a, a grammatical function in Japanese that comes up a lot is tokoro, which if you learn it as a noun, does anyone know what tokoro means? Place, but it's also a grammar function, so it does all these other things um, grammatically, and it's it has many many uses. It has many many versions and changes to it. So it's again, this is one of those things where you use it when you run into a situation. But also, for those of you that are current students, um, you may not be satisfied with the explanation that your textbook gives or what you hear in class. That would be a time to come and check this and see what else is in here to help you out with that. Um, I will give you this tome <laughs> but yeah it is um you know and i think we get very used to the convenience of an online dictionary but uh and the reason why i bring this one up specifically is because there really is no online equivalent to it there's sort of hack and slashes to it but if you look through it you'll see that the explanations are fairly substantial and ask a lot of you as the learner so it's a big time investment to this but it's a worthwhile one um i would say in the thousand level it's probably a bit much you the Frankly, the glossary in your textbook will do just fine. But as you move up in levels, 
to the 4,000 level, even the 3,000 level, this becomes a much more valuable resource. And then when you leave the university, you know, you're not taking classes anymore. You're on your own to figure all this stuff out and you need to have access to things like this. So um, uh, the other one, I and so another one kind of to like dial it back. So kind of like a really simplified version of this is um, Japanese core words and phrases, things you can't find in a dictionary. Um, and so the thing about this that I really like, and there's gonna be another resource that I'm gonna show you that kind of matches this, is that Japanese is really built on, so for example, one of the things that is very particular to English is the amount of idiomatic usage. So idioms, which are explicitly defined as phrases that um, by knowing the definitions of each word, you can't actually understand what it means without knowing about it already. So like kicking the bucket. If you're not a native speaker of English, all you think about is actually kicking a bucket, but if it actually means to die, right? And if you're not a native speaker of English, that makes no sense. Um, so, but Japanese also has not exactly idioms, but it has a lot of these really, these, these set standard phrases, these ways of talking about things. And um, they convey a lot of nuance and meaning and they're, they're not really taught as explicit grammar lessons. And so this is kind of like, you know, if you're reading something in Japanese and you hit this phrase that you can't parse out, it may be hiding in here. Um, and the next resource I'm going to show you is very similar in that way. And so this dictionary, you can sort of peruse it, but it really does rely on you sort of interacting with Japanese either in your class or in real life. It's also very cheap. Well, not very cheap. It's 16 bucks, but we have one for free in the library. Um, uh, but it takes a lot of like really abstract ideas and kind of puts it in really plain English for you to understand. So whereas that three volume set sort of is like no mercy, um, this is sort of more approachable. Those obviously deal with a lot more things. This obviously deals with sort of like things you're more than most likely going to run into in day to day life in Japanese. Generally speaking, if it's thinner, it's easier to read and deals with more pragmatic issues. If it's thicker, it tries to cover everything that could ever happen ever. Um, so if you started studying classical Japanese, you could actually use that dictionary to figure things out. Um, but so Japanese core words and phrases. So for example, um, so for example, they go over, I just picked a phrase kind of at random, but they talk about the idea of like, ima ni shite. And so you know ima, and you know shite or suru, and ni is the, the particle. And so ima ni shite, so now do and if you have rudimentary japanese grammar skills like what does that mean that doesn't i don't understand those words together don't mean anything and so what it means imanishite and it's often always paired with omoeba or sort of like if i think and the nuance of it is um now that i think about it right and the phrase now that i think about it in english means more than just the individual words. Well, now that I think about it, means that as you're recalling something, you realize it's more important than it was at the time that it happened. So for example, imanishite omoeba is followed by a description of something that happened or existed in the past and shows the speaker's emotional involvement and subjective interpretation of the matter. Although the speaker did not take the matter seriously at the time, he or she now becomes aware of its value and significance. The statement may imply regret, compassion, or some other emotion. So that's a much more sophisticated, um, so even though it's made of like now, this, and think, it actually conveys a very specific type of tone and a very specific type of feeling and way of thinking. Um, and it, this is a really good way to sort of, uh, it's really good for dealing with self-expression, which is one of the biggest challenges of really gaining fluency in any language. So um, whereas this, pardon me, whereas this book sort of deals with how to do stuff like how to do a thing. I need to do a thing with stuff. That book sort of deals with self-expression and emotion. And that is, uh, and, and moving into the capacity to self-express in a foreign language is a really big challenge because your, all of your notions of like what sadness is and what loneliness is don't apply when you do a new language. There's a whole other set of cultural norms that sort of define those emotions. And so the last one, and I actually forgot to grab this off the shelf, um, is the Effective Japanese Usage Dictionary. And so this um, is very similar to that uh, core words and phrases dictionaries in a lot of ways. But what it deals with is it really does a good job of dealing with fairly ab abstract 
ideas in Japanese. So it's called, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's like a practical dictionary meant for daily use, but it actually deals with a lot of things that are really complicated. So Japanese has really um, sophisticated ways of talking about time and space, um, especially changing conditions. Th there's a lot of different verbs that deal with this in Japanese. Um, there's a lot more nuance to them. They have a lot more shades to it than we do in English. And that is a real struggle for English speakers. It's like, which word is the right word to talk about condition? Um, <clears throat> and then of course, there's some more pragmatic stuff like name of an object, but they kind of define everything according to these sort of very abstract relationships. And again, this is a book that kind of, you know, when you encounter a, a sort of phrase that you can't parse out into its individual pieces to find the meaning of, this is the kind of dictionary you want to use to sort of sort that out. And so, uh, you know, these are all very short introductions to different uh, dictionaries. So this is not useful at the beginning of your Japanese, like at the 1000, 2000 level, you don't even really need to worry about this that much. Um, but I would say that if there is a, but what I will tell you is a lot of grammar you learn in the 1000 and 2000 level, those phrases sort of reemerge in slightly different ways later. And then it gets confusing why they're different. And then you have to sort of suss out like um, these kinds of things. But if these are the major categories that this dictionary deals with in your textbook, when you suddenly see a grammar lesson that talks about um, conditions, you may want to come and consult this dictionary to see if they can explain the dictionary further. The other thing that's nice about this dictionary is that it explains it bilingually in English and in Japanese together. So you can kind of start to get a feel for how Japanese people define their own language, which is a really important skill set that we're going to talk about next. Um, so at this point, I kind of move out of the slides and I just want to move online for you. So um, yeah, this one. So um, a couple of other sort of pragmatic things. And so this is kind of a threshold moment for a few different things. But um, you know, what is coming down the pipeline for all of you is making the transition away from something like jisho.org and actually using a Japanese Japanese dictionary. So this is in your future or in your present. Um, or when you go to Japan and uh, you need to be able to like ask Japanese people what a Japanese word means. But you need to learn to become comfortable with looking up Japanese terms in Japanese. And so there's a few different ways to approach that. And so um, pretty much the standard bearer for online Japanese dictionaries is this guy, weblio.jp. And it comes in quite a few. This is pretty standard Japanese web design, very cluttered, trying to include every possible situation. It's built on a very hierarchical design. Um, and I would actually argue that almost all of this is useless. The only thing that really matters is the search bar up here. And you'll see that they do a couple of things. There's a thesaurus, um, and an, a, a synonym and antonym dictionary, an English Japanese dictionary, Japanese English, Japanese Chinese, Japanese Korean. This is kogo or an old word dictionary, so like classical Japanese dictionary. Um, and then other dictionaries. So there's actually a sign language dictionary. Um, what is it? Oh, Indonesian, Thai, Vietnamese. But this is the one that matters. And we're and you can load it up and you can start to deal with, um, oh, so like let's do, uh, oops, mom. So if we go back to Momoto again, um, so this is, you know, uh, Japanese English, but if you wanted to switch it up, oh, this is the English sentence, English example sentence dictionary, actually. So let me go back, actually. So the blue one is the Japanese Japanese dictionary, just the Jisho. Um, so if we go back to something like Mamoru, right, this is really overwhelming when you start using a Japanese dictionary the first time. There's a lot of things going on. For example, you know, this, you don't know what it means. This two, um, uh, let me see. I think there's another, it's another example of little things. Oh yeah, this, you'll see this often, this triangle that has a specific meaning in Japanese dictionaries. These are all things you've never encountered before because you're not expected to learn to use a Japanese dictionary. But Japanese dictionaries, they have all these, regardless of the company that makes them, they have all their own conventions. And so this is something that you have to learn about over time. We're not gonna go into the nitty gritty of that here, but just know that it does exist. Um, and so dealing with, so there's tons and tons of these, uh, def, bleh, excuse me, definitions and nuances, you know, and it's just like, uh, and most dictionaries do it by most common meaning first. 
to less common as you go through time, as you go down. And then this slash here is the source they pulled it from. So this definition comes from the Manyoshu. So it's probably not very useful for modern day Japanese. This one comes from, uh, I'm assuming, Genji no Monogatari. Again, probably not very useful for modern Japanese. But again, as you move closer to the top, you get uh, more and more into uh, uh, the uh, conventional uses. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to bring up was uh, just a quick uh, introduction to stuff for your phone. So there's um, Imiwa, which I've mentioned before. This is the standard bearer on iPhones. If you, uh, and it's just Jim Breen's dictionary. There's also, if you have Android, there is JED, Japanese English Dictionary. And guess what? It also uses Jim Breen's dictionary file. So these two different apps have the exact same systems. It's really the interfaces that are different. Um, and there are some pretty great interfaces. The other thing, and I don't have time to go over it really clearly, but there's an app, but they're also, these are the standard bearer Japanese dictionaries in Japan. So there's the Daijirin, the Daijisen, and uh, where to go? Uh, whoops. Okay, well, I've, there's another one called the Kojien, so we're going to leave that one off. But in terms of apps you can get, I can't speak for Android phones at this point. The Daijinin, um, actually, let me start with the Daijisen. The Daijisen's specialty is modern contemporary Japanese. It doesn't really deal with older stuff, it's just here's how Japanese is spoken now. There's another dictionary I don't have up here called the Kojien. And that is more similar to the English Oxford Dictionary. So does anybody know how the English Oxford Dictionary is arranged? Like what, one of the things that makes it particular is that it starts with the oldest definitions first, and then as you go down, it gets, goes to the more modern one. So it shows you the change of a word and meaning over time. Um, so the Daijisen and the, and the Kojian are the opposite of each other. Daijisen is purely contemporary, da, and Kojian is historical. And if you watch like the Japanese news, you know, when you read something that says, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary defines uh, civility as blah, 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 blah. That's what the Kojian is for the Japanese. The Kojian defines blah, blah, blah as, like, that's how newscasters use it. Um, the Daijirin is kind of this middle ground uh, where it does, it does do both. It arranges it so that the most common usage is first, the less common is last. I can't stream the Daijirin on my, from my phone. I own both. These are, hefty, uh, these are hefty apps. This is $21. Very expensive for an app. It takes up like four gigs on your phone. Um, but it works offline. And so if you are in Japan, it's really nice to have this on your phone. Um, and I actually really like it a lot. And it does a lot of interesting things. Like it has an enormous number of place names in it. So if you're ever riding the train in Japan, if you type the name of a train station in, there's a good chance that it will exist in that dictionary and you'll learn the history of it. Like I was taking the train from Osaka International Airport and I was bored. So I just started looking up the place names and it turns out like a bunch of them were like, they used to be horse stables, things like that. Just you learn these weird, unusual things about these towns that have these larger histories. Um, and what I will, I will also do a plug for the, I'm not being funded by the company that makes Daijirin by Sanseido, but um, they, uh, they, um, their interface is really good. They have the smoothest, fastest interface I've used. The Daijisen may have improved, I don't know, but I really like the way this interface is set up. Um, and it does a lot of great linking, and there's something that Japanese electric dictionaries do called jumping. And you know, if you're ever going to buy a, a Japanese electronic dictionary, you always need to make sure it has the jump feature, which is what lets you sort of highlight text and then look it up inside the dictionary, like on the spot. Um, but it's a really smooth, easy to use. You can adjust the font size. I really like it. You can share to Facebook what words you're looking up if you want. So, um, but this is a great app. It's just expensive. But if you are looking to ask for a birthday present, maybe you could get your family to give you a, a Apple gift card or a Google gift card. And so the last thing I kind of want to bring up is um, I actually came across this website because a student came to me for help and they had a very specific question, which was, what's the difference between uh, Mokuzai and Zai Moku? And you're going to run into this a lot in Japanese. Not just, I don't just mean like the reverse of the two characters, but like these words that it's almost impossible to tell the difference between. 
And you're like, I don't understand how these are different. There's really no, in, there's no dictionary in English that really addresses this kind of situation. Um, you have to speak Japanese to get these situations addressed. Uh, and so what we came across is this really cool website called the Chigai Wakaru Jiten, so the Dictionary of Understanding Differences. Um, and in fact, if you look it up, oops. So if you look it up, you'll actually get uh, a whole article on the difference between Zaimoku and Mokuzai, but this is really only accessible to you if you can read Japanese. So this is later in your Japanese career. So you're just not going to have sort of the breadth of vocabulary to run into these situations at the beginning of learning Japanese, but you will start to run into it when you um, uh, get into the higher levels. And one of the ways you can kind of deal with this is, you know, if you have a word that you're really struggling with or two words you're really struggling with, um, what would be the logical thing to type after this to look, it, look up a word or try to understand it in Japanese? Oops, not that. As soon as I can type, I swear. Blah. Imi. Yeah, just type a word and put imi in meaning. And so you can get access to like what it means. Um, and you'll see here that it's, you know, and here's explicitly the uh, explanation right here. So mokuzai is sort of like lumber, like what you're seeing up here. Whereas zai moku is more like when you go to Home Depot and you're buying like two by fours. So sort of processed lumber, but stuff that's going to be used for building materials. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of like, here's what's really going on with these words that seem like they're identical. And you'll see right down here, it's like, oh, related articles. So there's the difference between uh, mori, hayashi, and sonrin, or rinson. I forget which way to read it. Um, but it'll tell you like how these three very similar things are actually different from each other. And you can load it up. It, this website does other fun things. Like it's like, what's the difference between high octane gasoline and regular, right? Because it's the dictionary of understanding difference. Um, and so uh, the final plug I'll sort of make at that point is uh, when your Japanese gets better and when you feel a little more comfortable and you're able to handle stuff like this, it is worth maybe considering answer the questions you have with a Japanese website instead of an English one, because then you're using your Japanese in the service of getting an answer to a problem you have. And so if you don't know the difference between high octane and regular gasoline or why it matters or when to use it, why not look that answer up in Japanese and find out what it is? And you'll still have the information, you just did it in a different language than in English. So you're using your Japanese in a way that's pragmatic and useful to you to answer questions in your life. And that's kind of, in a way, the ultimate goal of language fluency is you want to be able to address problems you have with that language as if it was your own. Um, and sure enough, if you look up, by the way, high octane in Japanese is high octo. I think I can just look it up that way. Yeah, regular to high octo no chigai wa. So there you go. If you want to know the difference, you can read about it here instead of reading about it in English. But um, it's a fun and interesting website. I highly recommend it. It's just got a lot of entertainment value to it. And then you'll see here there's a ton of other different, like, how are these things different? So, all right. That is everything. Do you guys have any questions about sort of everything we went through? I know it was a lot really quick. It really was meant to be just like surface level, but just to get you comfortable with the idea that all this stuff exists. You can leave it on the chair. That's all right. Um, oh, uh, and next time we'll do character dictionaries and we can address this and how these work. So.